This lecture, the sixth uh, in our Gazing into the Past series, will be devoted mostly to a single album, but one of the great albums on the whole of Chinese painting, uh, and by one of the one of everybody's favorite Chinese artists, that is uh, Shi Tao. We used to call him Dao Ji, but that was based on a misreading of a signature seal, and that's been corrected, and he properly should be called Shi Tao or Yuan Ji, also other names that don't concern us now. Well, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, uh, whenever people asked me, who is your favorite artist? I would say for the early period, it's Xia Gui. For the later period, Shi Tao. And of all Shi Tao's works, a great many, he was very prolific, Everybody's favorite, and mine, is this 12-leaf album that he painted in the 1680s, or 90s maybe, uh, it's not dated, best known as the album for Taoist Yu. And it's, to make it more mysterious, it's presently whereabouts unknown. But I am able to show the album in really great original slides and detail, so I'm doing that to give everybody the album, even though I can't tell you where to see the original. For information about this album, and for information about Shi Tao generally, the best source in English by far is the book by Jonathan Hay, titled Shi Tao, Painting and Modernity in Early Qing China, Cambridge University Press 2001. The only photo of Jonathan I seem to have is in this group photo made on our travels after the Anhui School Symposium in Hefei in 1984. He was then still a student in China, and I got to know him then. He stopped with us for some days in Berkeley when he came to the U.S. on his way to the East Coast, where he would become a grad student at Yale, working with Dick Barnhart. He teaches now at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York. We differ on lots of matters, and we've argued, as is natural, considering that we belong to different generations. But I think that behind our arguments lies a lot of mutual respect. Okay. Jonathan writes of this album on page 251 of his book that it's, quote, undated but probably painted around the late 1680s for Wu Chengxia, a committed lay Taoist, whose father, Wu Junbo, was present at Guangzhen Monastery when Shi, Shi Tao painted the above-mentioned snow landscape in 1673, end quote. I myself have dated the album a bit later to the mid-1690s, but I can't argue the matter, at least not here. Next. I myself had published this leaf, the best known and most often reproduced, in my 1960 Scira book, writing a paragraph about it. Next. But the whole album had been published before that by the owner, Victoria Kontag. It was in the collection of Ming Qing paintings, the Niu Jai collection. She took the name Niu from the mythical Niu or Niu Gua, sister of the legendary Emperor Fu Shi. She had brought this collection together during her time living in Shanghai in the 1980s, and she had published four leaves from the Shi Tao album in her 1955 book Zwei Meister Chinesischer Landschaftmalerei, Shi Tao und Shi Qi. And she had published in the same year a smaller book in a limited edition. I've had a copy of it for many years, but I'm not sure I could find it now. A little reproduction book with a short text titled Chinesische Landschaften Zwölf Tuschbilder von Shi Tao, in which she reproduces the whole album. Next, please. The album was stored, along with the rest of her collection, at the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City, where her good friend Larry Sickman looked after it for her. I had seen the album there on one of my early visits to the Nelson Gallery, where Larry showed me paintings. He always did this himself, never leaving it to a curator or an assistant although he was the director of the Nelson Gallery. That was Larry. And Sickman had himself published a leaf from the album in his book, The Art and Architecture of China, that he co-wrote with Alexander Soper, published in 1956. Next, please. I became a devotee of the album myself and discussed it, reproducing two leaves in the catalog of my 1967 exhibition, Fantastics and Eccentrics in Chinese Painting. I'll read later what I wrote about two of the leaves there. Dick Edwards, who organized the exhibition The Painting of Dao Ji at the University of Michigan in the same year, 1967, was understandably unhappy that I had already reserved two of Shi Tao's greatest paintings for my show 
and its catalog. And in my compelling image, the Harvard Lecture Book published in 1982, I reproduced no less than seven leaves with a famous one on the cover, as you see here. Jerome Silbergelt put the same one on the cover of his 1985 book, Chinese Painting Style, which I recommended in the first lecture in the Pure and Remote View series, and so forth. Uh, this has become, as I say, everybody's favorite Shortau album, and this leaf is an especial favorite. It's become one of the most familiar of all Chinese later, later Chinese paintings. Next, please. Now we come to the later history of this great album. Victoria Kuntog was retired and living in Hofheim near Cologne. I visited her there and spent most of the day talking with her in the winter of 1956. But before that, it must have been in the early 50s, she decided that she wanted to sell her collection, or most of it, and give the proceeds to her daughter. And Larry Sickman had the responsibility for helping her to do this. We decided, I can't remember whose idea it was first, but I was involved in it, we decided that it would be an ideal purchase for Avery Brundage, whose collection was just then going to San Francisco, where it would become the Asian Art Museum. Brundage was an objects person. He didn't understand or like paintings, but he realized that his collection needed them, and he wanted to acquire a whole collection of them at once and be done with it. The Quantog collection, it seemed to us, would be an ideal acquisition for him. Next. So Larry Sickman and I together with C.C. Wong, who was acting as Contog's agent for this sale, met for a weekend at the Nelson Gallery and went through all of her paintings, excepting the few that she wanted to keep because they bore inscriptions that she was especially fond of. These did not include the best things, which were all to go to Brundage. We assigned values very low to each of the paintings as we looked at it. The whole collection, which included the great Chertow album, Larry was willing to let it be included, although he had hoped to acquire it for the Nelson Gallery. This was typically generous of him. The whole collection, and many other, uh, with many other notable paintings in it, we evaluated the whole collection at, as I remember, $450,000. It would be a great purchase for Brundage, for whom this wasn't a big expenditure. He was paying about that much for a single piece of Southeast Asian sculpture around that time. I've been sure to hear, by the way, a different image of Larry to represent the usual one. This one taken by myself soon after we arrived in China on our 1973 delegation in a garden in Canton. I intended it to parody the famous painting subject of Mi Fu admiring a rock. So the entire Quantog collection was shipped to San Francisco and kept at the De Young Museum in Golden Gate Park, where the uh, Brundage collection was stored and where a new wing to house and show it was being planned. I was making my move to Berkeley at that time, and was of course happy about the prospect of having the Contog collection accessible to myself and my students just across the bay. Next please. Alas and alack, we had reckoned without the intercession of Yvonne Dargense, who had become Brundage's curator and trusted advisor, and who, I didn't realize this until later, who was committed to opposing and blocking anything proposed by myself, since he saw me as a possible competitor for Brundage's favor and attention. He was just then introducing to Brundage and persuading him to buy a group of paintings owned by the semi-crook, Jean Ursher, who had endeared himself to Darzon's teacher in France, Jacques Gernet. Jean Ursher's paintings were overpriced and some of them of dubious authenticity. The Contog collection would have been a far better purchase for Brundage. But Ewan was deeply jealous and protective of his relationship with Brundage and resented my, as he saw it, muscling in. He persuaded Brundage that too many of the Contog paintings were of low quality or in bad condition or were otherwise undesirable. He even managed to find scholars in the field who had, he told Brundage, doubted the authenticity of the Schertau album. So, in the end, Brundage made Quantog an insulting offer to buy only a small group of the paintings. She was outraged, understandably, and decided to withdraw the whole collection and ship it back to Kansas City. Next. C.C. Wong, however, was too smart to let that happen. He quickly raised the necessary amount of money and bought the entire collection himself. He immediately pulled out several of the best things, including the Shirtau album, 
a landscape hanging scroll by Bada Shanran, and a Wu Bin Hen scroll, that I remember, and he had these sent to him in New York. New York. I persuaded him to offer the remainder, the ones he didn't especially want to keep, to people in the Bay Area at a slightly higher price, 15% more than Brundage would have paid. A small group of good pieces was purchased by concerned San Franciscans and given to the Asian Art Museum. Next. But the best things uh, of the group are lost forever to San Francisco. Here's an image of the present director of the Asian Art Museum, Jan Shu, a good guy. After three, shall we say, less fortunate directorships that the art museum, the Asian Art Museum, has had to live under. I won't go into that now, another time maybe. And so the greatest of Shertau albums, everybody's favorite, was lost forever to San Francisco, along with quite a few major Ming Ching paintings. Some of the paintings were bought. Uh, for the Stanford Art Museum, a benefactress purchased a small group of them, my choices, for our University Art Museum in Berkeley, and individuals around the Bay bought paintings. I spent a lot of time showing them and recommending them to potential buyers in the De Young Museum's basement, working to keep as many of them as possible in the Bay Area. But the great Chertel album was lost forever. Next, please. So, where is this great album now? Alas, the story isn't over yet, and I must admit that I don't know where it is. Here is a picture of Cece Wong and his wife, taken perhaps on some kind of anniversary, surrounded by their family. Again, it's a blurry photo for which I apologize. It's all I have. Above and behind Cece, holding a child, is his daughter Yen Ku King, and the man to the left of them must be her husband. She was herself a ceramic artist and highly a cultivated woman who took care of her father for many years, handling all his English language correspondence, traveling with him to symposia and other gatherings uh, to do interpretation for him and to look after him generally, and being the dutiful Chinese daughter. But seen in the upper right of this picture are two men who I believe are Cece's son and grandson. The son was younger than Yen Ku by several years, and when the rest of the family moved from China to the U.S. in the 1940s, I think it was in 1947, the son stayed behind and had to live through the bad Maoist years. Sisi used to talk often about his efforts to get the son out of China, even suggesting that he might have to turn over one or more of his best paintings to the Chinese government to get him free. At last he was successful and the son moved to New York. He and Yen Ku were at odds from the beginning. He resented the comfortable life that she had led while he was going through hardship in China. And inevitably, and tragically, the question of the disposition of C.C.'s painting collection became a big issue between them. I won't try to relate the whole story because I don't know it all in detail, but the lawsuit between them has been going on since C.C. C. Wong's death in 1993. One story is that he and his wife were taken to a kind of rest home at the end, and he was there forced to make a new will, which of course is contested by uh, Yen Ku and her husband. One of them, Yen Ku or the son, perhaps both of them, had withdrawn certain of the most important paintings from the collection sometime before Cici's death and stored them somewhere. The hand scroll attributed to Wu Chengyuan is another that's missing. The Bada Shanran landscape that came from the Kwantog collection turned up in a Beijing auction last year. I have no idea where Yen Ku and her husband are, or who is in possession of the Shertel album, or where it is. But I'm happy to say I made good slides of all the leaves many years ago with details, and I can use them for the rest of this lecture to bring you the best visual presentation of this famous album that's now possible a presentation that will have to fill in for access to the original album until it finally resurfaces. Next, please. One more delay, however, before we turn to the album. I want to lay out briefly my argument about how the special circumstances of Chertow's life affected his choices of painting styles. Unlike other artists of the time who spent most of their lives in one place and worked in the local or regional style associated with that place, Chertow moved around throughout his life, spending time in the Anhui region, in Nanjing, briefly in Beijing, 
and finally from 1687 in Yangzhou. In the two graduate seminars that I gave on Chertow during my teaching years, I argued that his mastery of the local styles during his periods of residence in these places permitted him by the 1680s and 90s to adapt these different landscape types to his purposes, sometimes responding to the regional origins of the person for whom he was doing the picture. Richard Vinograd, who was in the first of my seminars, published an article giving examples of this, as I did more briefly in my chapter for the Compelling Image book. Paintings done in the dry linear styles with color washes, such as the 1687 fine rain and dragon pines seen at left in the Shanghai Museum, or the great album scenes of Huang Shan in the Simi Tomo collection, draw on Chertow's period in the Anhui region. Next, please. He is still using this when in 1699 he paints the scenery of Huang Shan hand scroll, also in the Simi Tomo collection. On the other hand, during his period of residence near Nanjing, between 1680 and 1687, he absorbed enough of that dark, inky style of the local artists, such as Gongshen, their kind of composition and their use of heavy dotting, to paint such a picture as the one at right, Chertow's, that is, dated 1684 and also in the Shanghai Museum. Next, please. Or this amazing hand scroll titled 10,000 Ugly Ink Dots, painted in 1685 and, I believe, in the Suzhou Museum. I will have another lecture later showing these and other works of Chertow and discussing this aspect of his career as a painter. Next, please. In my lecture on priority and authenticity, that was an addendum to the first series, I showed how Chertow had taken a basic idea from a very original album leaf by Guangxian, showing a house on the cliff surrounded by dotting in green and orange color, something very new and how Chertow made a huge jump, far beyond anything Gongxian could have envisioned, into the great and famous leaf with a man in a house beneath a cliff. So I needn't make that argument again, or make that point again. Next. So, after that long account full of plots and counterplots, good guys and bad guys, here at last, a half hour into the lecture, is the first leaf of Chertow's album for Taoist Yu or rather the first leaf that I'm going to show. The leaves are not numbered, and as always in Chinese albums, they can be rearranged easily, so that the original order is usually difficult or impossible to determine, with the single exception of the inscribed leaf, which is always the last. The order in which I'll show the leaves isn't the same as in Contog's book or even in my own publications. It's quite arbitrary, meant to provide contrasts and alternations of ink only and color leaves, contrasts of more or less agitation and of other aspects of style. This leaf is definitely in Chertow's Anhui-derived style, done in dry brush drawing and without color. The landscape formations, however, are quite different from the stable, often monumental constructions of the Anhui school artists, such as Hongran. Chertow's landscape forms seem animated, organic, the upper central formation is like a pair of fists, clenched and pushed together. Next. Looking more closely at the clenched fists, we see that they form an arch over a cave-like passage through which several people are seen descending from above into the central part of the picture. A road leads down to the plateau, on which is the central image of the leaf, a house with a man standing in front of it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the detail of that, which I must have made, has disappeared. Next. This is the area below and to the right of the house, with bare trees growing from the projecting earth mass, and the descending road seen at the right. Next, please. And this last detail, from the lower right of the composition, shows more bare trees and two pines growing from a bank to the right of the house. Behind is what appears to be a waterfall. Next, please. <clears throat> in this leaf, one of the more conventional, less arresting of those in the album, and painted in ink only, a river flows from the top of a quite modest-sized hill, its source completely unclear, as is often the case with Chertow's waterfalls. We can't imagine where all that water came from. No northern Song landscape master would have done, done this. 
For him, it would have been a huge mistake that his viewers would immediately recognize and condemn. But we are in another age and another world of representation. The river pours past a house with an open porch, but no figure seen in it. Next. Below, a, gro a grove of leafy and coniferous trees emerges from behind a near vertical earth bank. This kind of tree group derives more from Yuan painting than from Song. We have seen them in paintings by Huang Gung Wang. Shertao has been around enough of the great collection centers by this time and seen enough of the masterworks of past ages for him to draw freely on all of them, as indeed he does. He must have had an extraordinary visual memory. Ha! <laughs> I say that in admiration as one who uh, possesses uh, such a visual memory himself, but is totally inept as an artist so that I have to do lectures instead. Okay. A similar group of trees, but smaller and blurrier, grows on the opposite bank of what appears to be a river, presumably an extension from the one seen above. Next, please. <clears throat> this leaf, painted in ink and colors and representing an evening scene, is one of the great arresting scenes in the album, and it's one that I reproduced in color in my 1967 Fantastic and Eccentrics catalog. That exhibition and its catalog caused something of a sensation in the Chinese painting world, not only in the U.S., a symposium about it was held at Asia House Gallery, and I still have a recording made of it, with the voices of Max Lurer and Alex Silper, along with those of younger people such as Wen Fong and myself, but also in Japan, where the text was quickly translated into Japanese and published, with many of the pictures reproduced. The passage that I wrote in the catalog about this leaf is better than I could write today, so I'll read it while we show details from the painting, moving from the foreground up and back. This is from the Fantastics and Eccentric Catalog, pages 84 to 87, which I'll now read. Some of the leaves are quiet in mood, others dark and dramatic. Outstanding among the latter is the evening scene, number 29 which opens with a huge, mysteriously luminous boulder in the foreground, accented by heavy spots of ink. Beyond is a dense mass of bushes or trees with forked bare branches protruding above. The river is white, as if reflecting moonlight. On the further shore are two houses among trees. Finally, we move back to the distant hills, across which the brush has been drawn in broad, undulating strokes of dilute ink. These can be read simply as the drifting mists of evening, but also suggest a flow of pure force through and beyond the picture, which thus becomes a small segment of a boundless continuum of, continuum of matter and energy. The brushwork conforms to no ordinary types. The semi-controlled suffusing of ink, the superimposition of wet, inchoate forms for a smoky or murky effect, the use of heavy green color over deep ink are fresh techniques appearing at a time when all possible ways of applying ink to paper might well have seemed to the Chinese to have been used and reused." End quote. Wow, that guy could really write. How I envy him. Next, please. The next leaf, in the order I'm considering them, is another in ink only, and a simple scene of trees by a river with a bluff above. But this one is interesting in that it appears to reveal several places where the artist has changed his mind as he worked, or was unclear in his own head about just what he was depicting. Two such places are seen at the left side. Above, in the upper left corner of the detail, the top of the tree merges confusingly with the left end of the bluff, and with one of the dimly drawn trees behind. Below this are places where we can't be sure whether it's branches of the tree or markings of the earth cliff that are intended. Uh, in my lecture on Xiao Gui, I rejected a hand scroll in the Nelson Gallery as his work because of some ambiguous passage of this kind. So why doesn't this make Shurtao's album suspect? But we are in a different pictorial world with different assumptions and expectations lying behind its visual method. Here, these may be seen as minor lapses in Shertow's clarity of purpose. Similarly, in the lower left corner, 
beside the road that runs along the cliff, he appears to have changed his mind, changing what began as a house with a rectilinear roof into a strange shaped earth mass. Next. A closer detail of the trees in the lower left of this detail are several forms made with three sharp dry brush strokes that look rather like flying birds. They are, of course, the leaves of a bamboo plant growing there, but the artist fails to draw in the stalks. The blobs of ink seem unnecessarily large and black. And so forth. This appears to be a leaf that Chertow painted in haste and with uncertain purpose. But that can be said of a great deal of his later landscape painting, and it doesn't reduce his greatness as an artist. Somewhere in one of the reminiscences on my website, I tell how I once owned five late genuine landscape album leaves by Chertow that were so bad that by general agreement, we, the grad students in my Chertow seminar and myself, we sold them at auction and used the money to establish the Chertow Fund to be drawn on when students needed money for special purposes, such as having dental work done. Next, please. And now at last we arrive at everybody's favorite leaf, the great one with a man seen in his house beneath a cliff in the midst of a highly activated world of forms that change back and forth as we gaze at them from being rocks and peaks and being marvels of sheer vibrant brush energy. Once again, I feel that the 1967 James Cahill wrote about it better than the 2011 one can talk about it. So I'll read from page 87 of my fantastic and eccentric catalog as the details change before your eyes. Here we go. In the most powerful leaf of them all, number 29, a man is seen at his desk in a house beneath an overhanging cliff. The rocks are outlined with thick, broken, dragged strokes, varying in tone from pale gray to the deepest black, with the heaviest areas leading the eye from the right foreground along an S-curve that in encloses the house. The upward-pointing rocks below initiate a movement which is carried upward and back by interweaving strokes like streams of pure energy that dissipate at last into the void at upper right. Everything interpenetrates, interacts. The Taoist and Neo-Confucian conception of the world as organism is set forth here as compellingly as in any Song painting. Over the whole structure are scattered large dots, or dian, or dots, in light blue and red-brown tones, another brilliant innovation of Tao Ji's. They do not cling to the masses, but seem to hover above them, like agitated motes of weightless matter, reducing the bulk of the, under, of the underlying forms to the point where rocks change before one's eyes from corporeal objects to insubstantial networks of line, like grasses blown in the wind. Scarcely noticed at first, in the midst of all this, is the scholar in the, his retreat, gazing outward, surrounded by sheer bursts of light and color and movement, but remaining placid. To such painting as this, the issues of abstraction and realism, amateur and professional, individualism and orthodoxy, are irrelevant. It transcends both tradition and eccentricity. Dao Ji reestablishes old values and brings the new to culmination with a magnificent effortlessness. He stands as one of those titans who demonstrate that no possibilities are ever closed absolutely. What was done once can, mutatis mutandis, be done again. But in the case of Dao Ji, it was done through means so particularly his own that his statement remains unique and isolated. Eccentricity and tradition were to continue to share the scene between them. End quote. Next. Another of the quieter ink-only leaves with a simple scene, a man in a boat near the shore, a bare willow, a distant hill. His fishing pole rests on a simple forked stand, and he gazes off idly into the distance, contemplating nothing. Next. We are familiar with pictures of this kind of scene. Here is one, older and painted in color, that we saw in the Hikoen lecture. The man in this one is actively fishing, and the surface of the water is ruffled with wind. Chertow uses familiar themes that he knows will evoke 
comfortable responses in his viewers. Next. Or this one, also from the Hiko N album, which is a convenient repository of lots of small paintings of popular subjects. Here the man is also actively fishing, holding out his fishing pole. The tree on the shore this time is a blossoming peach or plum tree beside a willow. Next. The hill in the distance of Chertow's Leaf is simple in shape, but the way he represents the top of the mist along the shore is interesting. With an intricately meandering upper edge, and with an area of gray mist separating the white below from the dark hilltop above. This too must have been done with some random technique that is hard to analyze, at least for me. It cannot have been done with the customary controlled brush movements. We begin here to see, and we'll see more of as we go on, Chertow making use of unconventional techniques that his orthodox school contemporaries would not never have touched. Next, please. This leaf is another of the great colored ones, an intensely vibrant scene that does exciting things to your vision as you gaze at it. The sub subject is simple, a man seen through the window of a house in upper left, more houses seen only as roofs in upper right, a stream running between rocks below, blue mountaintops above. But the execution and the whole conception is far from simple. If we go back to the old device of imagining ourselves painting the picture, we feel suddenly charged with a kind of intense nervous energy that must approximate what Chertow felt as he painted it. Most effective is the dotting over the whole lower part, which represents in a highly activated way the stream flowing between rocky banks. It adds an air of vibrancy and energy to this lower section. Insistent repetitions of simple forms, the upward cupped markings on the water repeat the tops of the rocks. The shapes of the rocks themselves repeat as we recede from lower left corner into middle distance. All these pull the whole scene, in spite of the diversity of forms, into a coherent vision. Next. The house with the man seen through the curtained window in the upper story does not itself seem solidly based on earth. It floats in the vibrating mass of large dots, similar in shape but buried in ink tone, with pale blue washes behind, that represents or conjures up in a way that goes beyond simple representation the grove of leafy trees that surround the house. Next, please. Even the distant mountaintops prove to be arresting when we look at them closely. They are not painted with the usual simple graded washes of blue. The pigment on them is dried with sharp edges and a curious reticulation within them. Some new techniques at work here. What, what it might be I'll talk about in connection with the next leaf. Once more, the upper edge of the mists escapes the usual clear boundary drawing with a brush, having been produced by some technique hard to analyze. The same can be said of the lighter blue in the sky above. Next. Here is the next leaf, or the next I'm showing, along with the detail that reveals instantly the special new techniques of applying washes of pigment that I'm talking about. Let me elaborate on that before going on to the rest of this extraordinary painting. The blue pigment has been applied and made to dry in some way that doesn't leave the smooth, simply graded washes we usually see in passages of this kind. Instead, it dries in a strangely puddled way, with articulated edges and na interior natural patterns. I noticed this strange technique, which seems to work best with heavy mineral pigments, long ago in looking at this and other late paintings by Chertow, also those by his contemporary Yun Shuoping, then came to recognize it also in paintings by Yangzhou masters of the next generation, such as Li Shan, and finally and most clearly, in paintings by 19th and early 20th century artists such as Ren Bonian and Wu Chongzhi. I can so show a series of close-up details from later paintings to make this point, but I don't have the images easily accessible. Well, if you go, go to my website, click on the Responses and Reminiscences series, go down to number 74, which is mostly about Roksho Yake, or green pigment burning, and read the last paragraphs of that, you will find the best explanation I can offer after years of asking around. I was finally given a written account of how it was done by my artist friend, Chung Shifa, who was the subject of the second lecture in the series. 
Chung's explanation could be translated like this, quote, Painters often added glue to the pigment. They used water to dissolve, dissolve the glue before blending in the pigment. When the glue used is enough, it does not create sediments. Later painters use less glue. That's why there are traces of the sediments. Some painters found the effect useful and adopted it in painting. Wu Changshu and Ren Bonyan use this technique quite often. End quote. So there you are. And here we are observing the great and endlessly innovative Chertel using it at a very early period. Whether discovered by himself or adopted from other artists of his time, such as Yun Shoping, I can't say. Another subject for a serious study by someone with sharp eyes and a lot of patience. On to look at the rest of this amazing painting by Chertel, which has further visual surprises for us in the rest of its composition. Next, please. The main mountain peak and the forest below. Now let's try our familiar exercise. Imagine how this was painted. What movements of the hand with the brush? What? You can't? Right. There isn't any brushwork in the traditional Chinese sense. Has Chertel been looking at Western watercolors and imitating those? That thought might come into your head, but it will be followed quickly by another. No, because nothing comparable would be done in the West either for another few centuries. So how are we to understand this? Answer, we can't. Like so much in Chertel's finest works, it is an inexplicable feat of sheer creativity breaking rules, anticipating the future. And how are we to understand that? I could give a somewhat flip answer. We aren't, we are not to understand it and shouldn't try. Or I could recommend that you go off and read the long last chapter, mostly on Chertel, in my compelling image book and then come back. But neither is good strategy for a lecturer. Let me just say for now that Chertel's inscription on this album which we will encounter on the last leaf, says, quote, this method that is no method, this is my method, end quote. And to try to explain what he means by that, I would have to quote numerous other writings by him, as I do in the compelling image chapter, about this concept of method. But let me, with this image on screen, or with a closer detail of the forest alone, quote a few of these passages from that chapter. At the beginning of that chapter, I quote the Orthodox school artist Wang Hui, pointing out how the development of regional schools of painting had come to present artists with such a diversity of choices that, as he puts it, quote, the, student, the students with brush in hand are at such a complete loss that it's virtually impossible for them to penetrate the secrets of the art, unquote. I follow that with a quotation from the younger Orthodox master, Wang Yuan Qi, outlining how these regional schools had led students astray and how, quote, anyone who intends to learn the proper use of brush and ink should be on his guard against them, end quote. Proper use of brush and ink was, of course, exactly what the Orthodox school was all about. And it was exactly what Chertow was reacting against powerfully. He had probably met Wang Yuanqi in Beijing during his time there from 1690 to 1692, the two of them had even done a joint work together. And Chertow had written, again quoted from the beginning of my compelling image chapter, quote, Long ago I saw the four-word phrase, Wa Yong Wa Fa. I use my own method and was delighted with it. Painters of recent times have all appropriated the styles of the old masters, and critics accordingly say of them, so-and-so's style resembles the old masters, so-and-so's style doesn't. I could spit on them. Now I have come to realize that this is all wrong. In the broadest sense, there is only a single method of painting, and when one has attained that method, one no longer pursues false methods. Seizing on it, one can call it one's own method. But in fact, do not, I do not know what the old master's methods were, or what my own method is." End quote. In other words, let's for God's sake stop talking about proper and improper ways to paint learnable ways that everybody should follow, and paint what comes out of our own minds. Next, please. So there is Chertel confronting the fundamental problem of later Chinese painting, which is reflected in our gazing at the past title for this series. And he decides, I'm not going to do that anymore. 
and he tries to break entirely free of old habits of paintings. Oh. <clears throat> and, he, and he tries to break entirely free of old habits of painting into entirely new kinds of styles. And as we gaze at such a painting as this, we can only say, my God, he really did it. Was he then to free Chinese painting forever from the burden of the past? Alas, no. Age and illness and overproduction and other factors pushed him in his late years into painting endless albums and other works, some of which I'll show in the later lecture. And these were for centuries what the Chinese painting world knew of Sher Tao, so that he was as little respected, largely ignored, virtually forgotten as an artist until the mid-20th century, when his greatness was recognized and the Sher Tao boom occurred with Victoria Contog's writings of the 1950s and Dick Edwards' exhibition and catalog The Painting of Daoji of 1967 as notable products of it in the Western world. I deal with quite a few of these later paintings by Chertau and the implications of them for the whole history of Chinese painting in the final pages of my compelling image chapter. And I end that chapter on that book with this sentence, quote, The magnificent failure of Daoji to bring about single-handedly the emancipation of painting from the weight of the past marks the end of the age in which that interaction of theorizing and painting had been most pervasive and productive, the most intensely self-conscious time of this most reflective of artistic traditions." End quote. Well, let me only add, no sentence I've ever written has been more quoted and more misunderstood Intelligent people have mistaken it to mean that I took Schertau to be ultimately a failure as an artist. Aug! To see what I really meant, I can only say once more and go off and read that chapter, but not now. We still have four more leaves in the album to look at. Next. This leaf is one of the milder ones, using light color with linear drawing, rather like the Shanghai Museum's 1687 Fine Rain and Dragon Pines that I showed briefly early on. A narrow bluff, a kind of promontory, extends into it from the lower right, with a road running along its lower side, leading through what is presumably a defile or narrow valley to some houses seen among leafy trees at the end of the promontory above. Next, please. This secluded residence is further guarded by a crenellated wall built across the bluff further back, presumably built to keep out unwanted intruders preserve the privacy of those who live there. Next, still closer. The coloring is subtle and unusual. See, for instance, the upper edge of the bluff, where orange wash shades into bluish. The foliage of some of the trees is autumnal red-brown. The trees are interestingly mixed in type. Next, please. An old spreading tree with a few bluish colored leaves grows on the flat top of the nearer bluff. The more distant ones seen in upper left of this detail are simply upright trunks with a few bits of leafage loosely connected to them. Chertau now invents his new world with an easy, completely unshowy brilliance. Next, please. And finally for this leaf, the low banks beyond the water and the hilltops in distance, these latter painted with the puddly applications of pale blue pigment that we have seen in several before, a quiet ending. Next, please. To be followed, at least in this showing of mine, by another knockout of a leaf, painted in ink only and depicting a rainstorm in a way no rainstorm had ever been depicted before, in China or elsewhere. The only exception to that statement might be in other works by Sherto himself, an album of horizontal leaves in the Palace Museum Beijing, of which I can't easily find the slides, has several leaves done in a wet, blurry manner that might precede this one by a bit. But even within Chertow's work, there are very few. And that an artist could invent this manner of painting, use it for a few album leaves, and perhaps others no longer extant, or which I don't know about, and then leave it to be rediscovered three centuries later, nothing like it so far as I know in between, is only one more of the amazing accomplishments of Chertow. Next. A man and his servant have taken shelter at the shore under leafy trees in a rainstorm. The wind blows the rain diagonally from upper left, 
too strongly for even the boat canopy over them to shelter them. When I speak of the newness of this within Chinese painting, of course I'm speaking as always on the basis of what I've seen of what survives, which is only a tiny fraction of what was painted, and a fraction heavily affected by the highly restrictive dictates of the literati critics of China, with their insistence on what they took to be good brushwork, aug. It's been some time now since I last pronounced uh, my condemnation of them and their disastrous effect on the survival of Chinese painting. Now I do it again. Your narrow, elite, male minority orthodoxy saw to it effectively that we lost a huge amount of painting that lay outside the bounds of what you could understand and approve. I don't think, by the way, that I ever asked C.C. C. Wong how the kind of brushwork seen in this leaf fitted within his concept of good brushwork, so I can't say what his answer would have been. He must have accommodated it somehow because he valued this album so highly. But as I say, I can't tell what, it, what his th thinking on this would have been. Next, please. And here, as always, we need to pause again and recognize our extreme good fortune in having the wealth of Chinese painting, much or most of it, outside Orthodox Chinese taste that is preserved in Japan. I hope you recall from Lecture 11C in the earlier series the three anonymous late Song paintings of travelers in seasonal landscapes kept in Kyoto temples, representing types not to be seen in China. This is the summer scene with a traveler about to cross a stream in a rainstorm. Next, please. The upper part of this painting reveals that half a millennium before Shirtao, some brilliant forgotten artist was conveying the force and the visual effect of the wind and rain in a way that anticipates his achievement. In an imaginary world in which all the paintings that were ever done in China are preserved and searchable by subject, I could no doubt put together a whole lecture on rainstorm pictures. Next. What seems as we look close at it, closer at it to be so momentary must in fact have been the product of a lot of time spent experimenting with ink and paper, developing the kind of control that underlies such an accomplishment. Exactly what is clearly defined and what is blurred, what are trees and land and what is wind and rain, must all be strongly controlled, even when the whole effect is of easy spontaneity. Next. The technique of using the brush with a tip divided, the so-called split brushwork, that was used by early artists such as Xia Gui, serves here to draw the double outlines of branches and twigs of trees. Some of the foliage or bamboo leafage appears detached, as it would indeed appear in a visual experience too intensely changing to permit structural coherence. The calculation of what to do first and what later, how to paint into a still wet area so that the ink strokes blur outward, can only be recognized as masterly if, again, we try to imagine doing it. In itself, it appears more to have come into being by some miraculous, fortunate happenstance. Next, please. And perhaps most near miraculous of all is the way this technical virtuosity and inventiveness is all made to pull together into a coherent image, so that until we look more closely, as we've been doing, we might simply dismiss it as a good painting of people in a boat in a rainstorm. We have been gazing for a long time, and I have made you gaze for a long time deliberately, at a small miracle of technical mastery, spontaneity, and immediacy taking place before our eyes. Next. Going on somewhat reluctantly to another leaf, the next to last in our series, we see a rounded hill with a waterfall pouring down its front, with the source of the water again left unexplained and unlikely. Four men have come out from their houses to sit on the nearer bank, gazing up at it, or at what, we, what can be seen above the dense white fog. The time must be evening. The sky above the hill is darkened. Next. The buildings from which they have come uh, have impressive temple-like roofs. Perhaps it's not a private residence, but a temple complex where they are staying. I remember well evenings in temples, venturing out after a hot bath, wearing only a simple cotton robe, called a yukata in Japan. Next, please. In any case, they are all robed alike, and all of them, seen from behind, are mostly bald, with only swatches of hair on the backs of their heads. They sit quietly, gazing at this little changing flow of water, 
which has the lulling effect on their consciousness. They are probably too far away and too separated from it by fog to enjoy the real physical benefits of gazing at the waterfall that I described in an earlier lecture, the one on Maluan, having to do with air charged with negative ions. Next, please. And here, finally, is the last leaf, with the inscription that can be rendered as, quote, this method that is no method, in fact, makes up my method. Twelve album leaves done for presentation to my elder brother, Daoz Yu, to enjoy. From the bitter melon monk, Ji, with two of his seals reading Yuan Ji and Shi Tao. Next. I don't have much to say about the painting, which represents an earthy slope with some kind of leafy bushes growing on it, leading down into the fog that covers a river or a canal. The sails of junks are seen in the distance, above the fog. A very ordinary scene in old China, nothing especially striking about it. A quiet close for the album, unless we stop to think, as Dallas Yu must have done, may have done, about all the implications of Shirtao's simple inscription. On what these were, I can only rec recommend once more that you read the last chapter of my compelling image book, in which I did my best to explore the implications of this and related inscriptions that he wrote on his paintings throughout these middle years and greatest years of his career. Next. The sails of junks above the fog raised a special remembrance in me, which I'll use to conclude. I owned several works by Chertow during my years as a collector, although never a major painting, since all those were far beyond my means. Next. One was a large album leaf, as a, mounted as a hanging scroll, bought from the dealer Kawai Shogado in Kyoto in 1955, representing junks with sails like these coming down a canal into a walled city, probably Nanjing, of which only the wall is seen. I can show you this image of it, but the painting itself is whereabouts unknown. I gave it up in my divorce settlement with my first wife, and I have no idea where it is now. It also comes from an album, of which other leaves are known. Neither album is dated, and the one that my leaf came from wasn't nearly as fine and important as the former Kuntog album, or Taoist Yu, the one this lecture is about. They may, however, date from around the same time. I put them together here only to show the similarity of the vision in each of sails appearing above fog with the boats unseen. And I remember once long ago on our first trip to China as we drove across the flat farmlands of Jiangsu province, maybe from Shanghai to Suzhou, seeing from the road the sails of junks seeming to be sailing across the fields, really moving along a canal, of course, with the boats and canal not visible beneath. Uh, and being told by our guide what a common sight this was in the Jiangnan or Yangtze Delta region, region where we were, a region interlaced with canals that were once the principal routes of transport and travel. Next. Here's an old photo of junks with sails on a canal that I pulled from the web. It's not very sharp, but it gives some idea of how they looked. As for what the canal boats themselves looked like up close, next. You can see that in, the, in this photo that I made of one in some town in the Jiangnan region. It's moored and it has its mast down and its sail furled under it. For centuries, they carried merchandise and some of them people all over the south part of China. Next. Now, alas, they're mostly gone, filled in, only to be seen in old paintings like this one, replaced with four-lane highways, noisy traffic, and the air filled with exhaust fumes so you can't see long distances anymore. Um, and with that bitter, nostalgic, old person's remembrance and observation, I end this long lecture on one of the incomparably great works of Chinese painting. I hope that the album itself will reappear before too long and pass into the safe hands of some major museum if that is, we can still talk of safe hands anywhere in the world these days. End of lecture.